Then start then. And welcome back to the afternoon session, everyone. We will now continue with our uh, second lecture series of the week, and then we will have a gong show session uh, afterwards. Uh, as before, we will be streaming on YouTube. So if you don't want to appear there, you should stay stay muted on the Zoom call. And also feel free to, to ask any questions by either unmuting yourself on Zoom or by writing in the chat box, and I will try to bring it up. And if you are with us on, on YouTube, you can also ask questions uh, on the Slack channel. And I will, again, try to bring it up if we have time. Yeah. So unless there's something else that the organizer want, wants me to say, then I think I'll introduce our next speaker. And we are very happy to have Thomas Hartman with us from Cornell University, who will tell us about the black hole information paradox. Yeah. Please, Tom. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, it's good to be here. So usually at a school, I would, I would sort of try to get to know the students and, and try to make this interactive. We'll do our best, um, but um, I guess it's going to be harder in this format. So please do feel free to interrupt during the lectures, and I'll try to get on the Slack channel and answer questions this afternoon. I won't notice if you hit the raise hand button, so um, just, just um, unmute yourself and, and jump in. Um, okay, so I'm just going to flash up some references. I'm going to, these notes are going to be posted online, so don't worry about um, trying to scribble everything down, but um, I just wanted to have it up there in case you want to refer back to the video. So uh, in particular, um, we wrote a review of recent progress in the information par paradox a couple months ago. That review is a very conceptual um, sort of overview of recent ideas um, and how we think about some of this recent progress. Uh, these lectures are going to basically be a more technical version of that review. So. Um, the review doesn't teach you how to calculate anything. Uh, the idea in these lectures is to um, explain some of that progress and also uh, show you how we do some of these calculations so that um, you're at the point where you can do some of the calculations yourself. OK, so um, to begin, so I'm, this is roughly split up into four lectures. I don't know if it'll actually turn out that way, but we'll take breaks uh, in between so that we don't have to go full two hours straight, uh, but roughly four. And uh, the first topic is the page curve. So here I just want to lay out the uh, paradox as it, as it is captured by the page curve. We're going to start at the very beginning with some discussion of black hole thermodynamics. So you have a black hole, uh, and you drop something into the black hole. When you do that, the black hole responds dynamically. Uh, it sort of ripples and fluctuates and returns back to equilibrium. So this process was studied uh, in the 70s. And very much to everyone's surprise, it was found that black holes obey the, some laws of mechanics, the laws of black hole mechanics, they called them, that parallel the laws of thermodynamics. And uh, at first, this was viewed as an analogy. And the analogy uh, made sense if black holes had a temperature, which was later understood to be the Hawking temperature, and an entropy, S equals area of the event horizon over 4 g newton G Newton H bar, so that's the area is measured in Planck units. So this was first understood as an, as an analogy, but um, as it became more and more detailed, it became clear that this was really supposed to be a fundamental property of black holes and quantum gravity that they obey, like that they behave like a statistical system. The temperature, the Hawking temperature, uh, which was first inferred, was first guessed up to a proportionality factor from these experiments uh, was 
soon after derived by Hawking, uh, who showed that um, if you quantize fields on this on the background of an evaporating black hole, that uh, you find a thermal spectrum of the quantum fields. Uh, but the entropy, so that's the that's the first one. The entropy, however, uh, remains mysterious. So for the most part, uh, we still don't understand the origin of black hole entropy. There are special cases in string theory where we can calculate it from first principles, uh, but the general story is still not clear. So a major part of the information puzzle, uh, the black hole information puzzle, is to understand the origin of the black hole entropy and to understand what it means to think about what it means uh, for the black hole to be behaving like a statistical system. In these lectures, I will not address uh, this aspect of the information paradox, the origin of the black hole microstates. I'm not gonna talk about the microstates. Uh, what I am gonna talk about uh, is how to think about the entropy and um, how to think about the black hole as a, what, how, how we have recently collected further evidence for the black hole being a statistical thermodynamic system. We're gonna start at the very beginning. So I wanna warm up with some discussion of Hawking radiation to set the stage. So the metric of the Schwarzschild black hole in four dimensions is one minus RS over R dt squared plus dr squared over one minus RS over R plus R squared d omega two squared. Um, if I'm, if I know there was some issues with the resolution, maybe in a previous lecture, so let me know if I need to write bigger and I can um, try to do that. So to understand uh, the easiest way to calculate the temperature of the Hawking radiation is to first zoom in on the horizon of the black hole. We can do that by introducing near horizon coordinates. So I'll set R equal to the Schwarzschild radius times one plus rho squared over four RS squared. Rho is a radial coordinate, which is equal to, which is small near the horizon. The factors are just there for convenience. We'll see in a second. We'll set T, uh, rescale T to be two RS times tau. Uh, and then we'll take rho much less than one to zoom in on the near horizon region of the black hole. So if you take this coordinate change and you plug into the line element, you'll find that the metric is near the horizon, approximately minus rho squared d tau squared plus d rho squared plus dot, dot, dot. The dots include the metric on the two sphere, which won't play much role, and the higher order terms in rho. These are actually Rindler coordinates uh, on a flat space time near the horizon. So the horizon is a perfectly uh, regular, ordinary, smooth place in that looks just like Minkowski space. Uh, so this line element is just the line, line, line element of R one comma one. Rindler coordinates, you can think of uh, as like polar coordinates Uh, in, in Lorentzian signature. To make that very clear, uh, let's go to, let's do a wick rotation to Euclidean time by setting tau is minus I TE, where TE is Euclidean time. Then the line element is D rho squared plus rho squared DTE squared 
plus dot, 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 uh, which you recognize as the metric of R2 in polar coordinates. Since this is polar coordinates, that means that TE is the angular coordinate. That is, it's identified mod 2 pi. If you, you have to identify at mod 2 pi for the Euclidean metric to be regular. So this is going to be something that will come back uh, as, we, as we turn to more complicated setups. Uh, but this is, so this is an important point here, which is that the Euclidean manifold um, should be perfectly regular at the horizon, which is at rho equals 0. The reason that the Euclidean metric should be regular at the horizon is that uh, this is a solution of Einstein's equations. And there's nothing special that at the horizon. There's nothing sitting there. Uh, so it should obey the source-free Einstein equations. And if I were to not identify mod 2 pi, then I would have a conical defect. And I wouldn't satisfy the Einstein equations at that point. If we translate this result back to the original T coordinate in Schwarzschild, uh, then what we found is that T is identified in imaginary time by an amount beta, where beta is 4 pi times the Schwarzschild radius. What this means is that uh, the quantum fields in this geometry uh, are at finite temperature. So this notion of, a, of periodic and imaginary time is a little bit mysterious at first, but it has a very natural interpretation as a thermal state of the quantum fields at temperature T Hawking is equal to 1 over beta. The reason for that uh, is, so this is, this is a well-known property of quantum field theory finite temperature called the KMS condition. Uh, the idea is that um, quantum fields at finite temperature are always periodic and imaginary time. There are various ways of understanding this fact. Uh, we're going to come back to one of them. We're going to come back to the path integral interpretation later. Uh, but for now, let me just point out a very direct way of understanding this, which is to think about observables. So if you think about, uh, for example, a correlation function of some operator, uh, like a two-point function, of some operator at finite temperature beta, then this is by definition the normalized trace of that of the thermal density matrix e to the minus beta h with those operator insertions. Where z is the partition function. Uh, at temperature beta, and uh, using the cyclic property of the trace, I won't go through the algebra, but in about two lines, you can uh, use the cyclic property of the trace and use the uh, evolution equation for the operators uh, to convince yourself that this is equal to O of x t plus i beta O of y zero at temperature beta. So I'm going to, at various points, I'm going to skip some steps, uh, but I'll assign that as a, as a take-home exercise. 
So if I write exercise there, that means that I think I've given you enough information to completely reproduce the result, but I've skipped some steps. So I encourage you to work through things on your own later. Uh, so uh, to summarize, we zoomed in on the near horizon region of the black hole. We said that it was just Minkowski space. And uh, then we said the smoothness of, a, of the horizon requires observables are periodic in imaginary time and concluded that the quantum fields are therefore at finite temperature. And some of these tricks will come back uh, as we go into more complicated situations. Let me pause here and see if there are any questions. Let's see, I'm trying to figure out how I can see everyone. Uh, most of you are hiding, uh, but please jump in if, um, if I have questions. I'm gonna assume that everybody just already knew all this uh, and continue unless someone wants to slow me down. Okay. So black holes radiate at the hogging temperature. Um, to set up the paradox and the page curve, now I'm gonna discuss black hole collapse and evaporation. Uh, looks like there's a question. There's a question, what does the beta signify uh, in this expression? So the beta just means that we're calculating correlation functions at finite temperature. So the definition of a finite temperature, so that like this first line uh, is, a, is a two point function at finite temperature. This is by definition um, equal to the thing on the second line. So this is the the trace against the thermal density matrix. And same, same goes for the last line. And that's, the, that's again, the trace against the thermal density matrix. Okay, there, I think there's a raised hand, but I, I, I'm not gonna, just, just go ahead and shout it out. Yeah, sorry, uh, just to repeat the question that I asked in the chat. So in the last line of that expression, we have already uh, taken care of that e to the power minus beta h uh, by shifting t by an imaginary value, right? Uh, no, not exactly, not exactly. What I mean is um, in, in the last expression, there are two, there's beta showing up in two places. So this is like, one over Z of beta trace E to the minus beta H. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna get the signs right if I try to do this in real time, but this is something like E to the um, I H T plus I beta. Um, I think I'm getting the sign wrong. O of X E to the minus I T plus I beta of Y. So the point is that the beta shows up in two places, but then you can use cyclicity of the trace to uh, put it back into the format of the line above. Okay. 
So the the Penrose diagram of an evaporating black hole you've probably seen before, but it looks like this. So here's the event horizon. Here's the singularity. And um, let's see, I'm gonna draw a couple other things on here to orient ourselves. So if this is a black hole that formed by collapse, notice that there's no second side of the Penrose diagram. If there was say a, a star which collapsed, then the star, the surface of the star would look something like this. So the star um, eventually at this point is undergoing gravitational collapse. It's going through its own event horizon. It's eventually headed towards the singularity. Um, if we think about quantizing, quanti quantizing the fields on this geometry, then uh, it's GR so we can quantize on any slice of this geometry, any kind of slicing that we want. But let me draw so what happens if you if you quantize on slices like this? Those first few slices, which are just going smoothly through, those are called nice slices. So um, we we showed that this is going to be radiating at the Hawking temperature. What that means in terms of the state of the quantum fields is that um, on this first slice, slice one, um, there might be a little bit of Hawking radiation created. Hawking radiation you can think of as being created uh, as, as you can think of uh, an outgoing or an exterior Haw Hawking mode as being paired with an interior Hawking quantum. So the reason that the, that the exterior modes are thermal um, is that we don't see the inside modes. So the, the quantum state of the, of the fields on this slice is a pure state, uh, but when we trace out the interior and don't look at the um, guy on the left, then we see the out, outside modes as being a thermal state. So if we go to later times, say we go to slice two, what's happening is the, um, what's happening is the, the black hole is getting Sorry, can you are are you seeing me on video or just my or just my screen? Um, both, I think. Both, good. Okay, okay. So I'm I'm making I realize I was making all those hands gestures. I'm not sure if I'm actually on in people's screens. Okay, so the the uh, inside of the black hole is basically stretching out as we go to these later slices. It's stretching out, and as it stretches out, uh, we're dumping interior Hawking modes onto that slice. So at slice two, now you've got um, more Hawking radiation on the inside, and that's entangled with the Hawking radiation on the outside. As we go to slice three, um, then we have even more Hawking radiation on the inside entangled with even more Hawking radiation on the outside. Uh, and these Hawking modes will head out towards scry plus and that's your Hawking radiation as observed uh, as a thermal state at infinity. Now, before we get to the paradox, let me uh, mention. Excuse me, Tom. There's someone who raised his hand, I believe. OK, please um, go ahead and, please. and shout it out. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, what do you mean by more entangled due to the Cauchy evolution? I don't mean that the modes are more entangled. I just mean that there are more of them. So the number so, of entangled state uh, is increasing, something like that? Uh, yeah, roughly speaking, you can think of each of these, like this, this mode um, here is entangled with this one here. And this one here is entangled with this one. This one is entangled with this one. Um, so, and the further we go in time, the more Hawking radiation we have, so the more interior modes we have as well. I see, okay. Thank you. Sure, okay. So, 
Um, remember I said earlier that the black hole entropy is given by the area over four. Uh, well, this decreases as a black hole evaporates. Uh, so this doesn't, uh, so there is no second law of thermodynamics for this formula for the entropy. Uh, but that's okay because actually um, we should think of the entropy uh, not just of the black hole, uh, but of the black hole together with, with its surroundings, which is called the generalized entropy. The generalized entropy is the area over four Uh, plus the entropy of the quantum field theory uh, for the region outside the black hole. Uh, so uh, in this case, it's the area at any given time or any given on any given time slice, say on slice three here, um, to calculate the generalized entropy on slice three, we would include a contribution from the area right here and then a contribution from the Hawking quanta uh, on this exterior of the black hole. And uh, this combination increases in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics. The basic statement of the information paradox is that the final state of the Hawking radiation is a mixed state. In quantum mechanics, you can't, uh, the Schrodinger equation is supposed to evolve, must evolve pure states to pure states. Uh, but in this case, even if we start with a pure state of the star, we end up with a mixed state of the radiation. Um, and so that is really, that version of the paradox is, is stated in terms of this slice four all the way at the top here, the late time slice. Because in this late time slice, uh, we just have the radiation. Uh, we don't have a black hole anymore. So we just have this pure state of the radiation. So that's the paradox. To make this a little bit more precise, uh, I'm going to introduce a few different notions of entropy and rephrase this in terms of the entropy. So the first one. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, I have a question. So the so the second entropy, which is the entropy of the QFT outside. Uh, so uh, are we making some assumptions about uh, the background? That are we fixing the background, or uh, because the, the two terms seem independent in the sense that the second one seems to be purely uh, evaluated inside a QFT. Uh, so. Yeah, that's right. So they're not. I mean, they're, they're not independent in the sense that uh, the radiation is back reacting. The fact that the black hole is radiating means it's losing energy. This right. back reacts on the geometry. Right. Um, so it affects, the, it affects the geometry through the Einstein equations. So in right. that sense, they're not independent. Right. Uh, but you're right that this, the QFT term, um, the second term here, is being calculated as if you first, so first you should solve the equations of motion. That is, you should find the metric of the, right. the, the evaporating black hole, back react, et cetera, let it evaporate. And then you should use the technology of quantum field theory and curved space to calculate the entropy outside. That's the, that's the rules of the game in the, semi, the, or, the usual semi-classical calculation of the entropy. We're actually so going to modify those rules in, okay. in these lectures. That's one of our goals, is to understand what you should do instead. But that's, that's the standard way of doing it. OK, so, so, so the states are on, on a back-reacted geometry, the, the states in the Q of T. Is that so? That's right. That's right. Okay. So the, yeah. the state, the, so when you calculate the, the entropy of the Q of T, of course, you have to calculate it in some state. Uh, so the state you should calculate it in is the one that, that starts out as, as being a star plus no, no Hawking quanta at early times, and then you should time evolve that on the back reactive geometry. Okay, thanks. thanks. Yeah.
Okay, so um, the entropy that we're mostly going to be discussing is the von Neumann entropy or fine grained entropy. This is the entropy of a associated to a dens density matrix rho is minus the trace of rho log rho. This thing goes by various names. Sometimes it's called the quantum entropy. Sometimes it's called the entanglement entropy, although that's, that's not really a great name for it in general because it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily come from entanglement. Uh, like if I just have a, a cup of soup at, at some finite temperature in a mixed state, then the von Neumann entropy would be the ordinary thermodynamic entropy. It doesn't, um, it only comes from entanglement if you think of the total system as being pure. A couple properties we need. So first of all, this vanishes in a pure state. That is a state uh, which is just written this way. It's constant under unitary evolution. Okay, so in particular, if we start in a pure state and evolve unitarily, like we should in quantum mechanics, then the von Neumann entropy of the full density matrix is always zero. This is to be contrasted with the coarse grained entropy. Uh, so the coarse grained entropy is what we usually think of in thermodynamics. So the coarse grained entropy is actually sort of more complicated than the von Neumann entropy. To define the coarse grained entropy, we need a state, rho, uh, and we also have to decide what macroscopic observables we're tracking. So like in thermodynamics, we usually track the energy, uh, maybe a couple other things. Uh, so we, we, we pick our observables, and then the coarse grain entropy uh, is the maximum entropy among all density matrices with, the, with those macroscopic observables. So this is the max of S of rho tilde, uh, where this is the von Neumann entropy of rho tilde. Uh, over all rho tilde, such that um, E dot 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 agree with rho. It's obvious from the definition that the coarse grained entropy is always at least as big as the fine grained entropy, because that's one of the density matrix you should, density matrices you have to consider in the maximum. Uh, but it can be much bigger. And in particular, um, in a pure state, the coarse grain entropy can still be large. The coarse grain entropy uh, obeys. The coarse grain entropy is the thing that obeys the second law, uh, because of course, under unitary evolution, we expect thermodynamic entropies to increase. That's the, the second law we see in, in everyday life, uh, while the while the fine grain entropy has to stay constant. I have a naive question. Sure. Um, shouldn't it be more natural to have a sum instead of the, the maximum for the entropy? Isn't there a contribution from all the states that have the same energy? Well, I, I think you're, yeah, that will often end up being the answer. So, um, but it's not the entropies that you sum. Um, you know, if, if you're in a thermal ensemble, you don't sum up the, you don't sum up the, it's true that the, that the density matrix is a sum of, it's dominated by the states of that energy, uh, but the entropies don't add because the entropy of each individual state is zero. The individual eigenstates. In fact, maybe I, I should, um, yeah, so, so 
if we fix only the energy, then um, you can show that the density matrix that maximizes the entropy subject to a constraint on the energy is just the ordinary, uh, the e to the minus beta h, the ordinary density matrix of a thermal state. So that so this agrees with the usual with the usual coarse grain entropy in a thermal state. I have a question. Yes. So the second law should be, uh, I mean, how should we think of this uh, second law in the sense that, I mean, usually second law holds for thermodynamic entropy. Uh, so here it is, it seems more general. It is defined information theoretically. So uh, is it the same as second law of thermodynamics? Or, I mean, does it give an understanding of second law of thermodynamics? Uh, uh, well, when I say it obeys the second law, I'm, I'm really talking about the ordinary thermodynamic entropy. The ordinary thermodynamic entropy is exactly this thing that I've written here, where we keep track of only only E. Ah, okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah, right. Okay. I, I think there are generalizations where you keep track of of more of more macroscopic quantities that also obey the second law, but but that's the stand, that's the the most basic one. The third and final kind of entropy that we're going to be discussing is a subregion entropy. So uh, this is something that makes sense when you have a theory that can be divided into two regions. These are regions not in space-time, but in space. So you fix a time, and then you pick a region A. The outside of that region is A complement. And you have a density matrix rho uh, that describes that is the state of the system on the full, on the full space. Then um, you can define a re reduced density matrix rho A by tracing the full state over A complement. So this is the reduced density matrix. And then the subregion entropy, which is often right, written S of A, is the von Neumann entropy of rho A. So a few things to note here. Uh, first of all, even if, if so if, if the full system is pure, then region A can still have, can still have a, a non-zero von Neumann entropy, a, a non-zero fine grain entropy, uh, simply because region A is entangled with region A complement. If rho is pure, uh, then you can show that S of rho A is equal to S of rho A complement. That is, in a pure state, the von Neumann entropy of a subregion uh, is the same for the region and its complement. The way to think about this is that um, this is a situation where you should really think of this as entanglement entropy. That uh, when the full system is pure and you just take a piece of it, then the von Neumann entropy measures the entanglement of A with A complement. And the entanglement of A with A complement is the same as the entanglement of A complement with A. So in this case, you get the von Neumann, same von Neumann entropy for both. So in these lectures, we're mostly going to be discussing the, we mostly, I don't think I'll even mention the coarse grained entropy again. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the fine-grained von Neumann entropy uh, uh, for subregions, mostly. Okay, any questions about that before I get back to the paradox? Okay, so now we're ready to talk about the page curve.
let's draw this evaporating black hole again. Ah, try again. So as we already discussed, so let me let me let me state what the goal is here. So we already discussed that if you wait until the black hole is completely evaporated, you have a paradox because that's clearly a situation where the final state is is um, is not pure. If we rephrase that in terms of the entropy, uh, then the paradox is that S. of the uh, the von Neumann entropy, the fine grain entropy of the radiate of the final radiation, that's what that density matrix is supposed to mean, uh, is not equal to zero. To formalize this in terms of these entropies that we were just discussing, I want to um, define uh, a region which corresponds whose density matrix we're talking about. So to do that, uh, I'm going to start by drawing an imaginary cut off outside the black hole. So this is uh, an imaginary cutoff at, say, a few short shield radii outside the black hole. The way to think about it is that gravity uh, and the black hole are important inside the cutoff but outside the cutoff, we just have weakly interacting quantum fields, including gravitons, uh, and we can sort of use ordinary quantum field theory without worrying too much about gravity. That's the way to think about it. Uh, and then um, we're going to define a region, which I'll call region R for radiation. The region R depends on uh, I won't always write it as R of T, but it will always be a region that depends on T, uh, where T uh, measures the left endpoint of region R. So R is for radiation. You should think of this as the region where we're sort of collecting the Hawking radiation. Uh, and at late times, um, this region just is everything. It's the whole system. Um, so when we're talking, uh, so this von Neumann entropy that we're talking about in the information paradox is S of R, the subregion entropy, as T goes to infinity. So we clearly have a paradox if we wait until late times. The point of the page curve is to sharpen this uh, and make the paradox appear earlier. We can do that. Uh, if we assume that black holes really are like statistical systems whose degrees of freedom or entropy go as the area. So to see this, um, what we're going to do is we're going to So to sharpen this paradox and see it, we, what we want to do is we want to see it at earlier times. We want to see the paradox when there's still a black hole. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare S of R to S of R complement. Now, um, we know that these are supposed to agree. But let's see what happens. Um, so we're going to plot this as a function of time, starting uh, with S of R. So S of R looks something like the following. Well, let me draw it first, Excuse and me. then I'll try to explain it. Excuse me, Tom. So maybe yes. just a heads up. Uh, in five minutes, maybe we can take some questions and a, and a short break. Sure. Well, um, let's see. Are we, are we strict about the exact timing? So my plan is to finish the page curve and then take a break, and then we'll go on to part two. Okay. Be, yeah, yeah, sure. We'll, we'll, we'll do the whole thing in two hours, though. Yeah, sounds good. Um, okay, so the, this curve looks something like this. 
and then flattens out. So this is S, this is Hawking's calculation of S of R, the fine grained entropy of the radiation. The um, basically the, the Hawking radiation comes out, uh, it's, it's thermal. So the more Hawking radiation there is, the more entropy it has. Eventually the black hole is gone. At that point it levels off. So this is the evaporation time T evap. Now I wanna compare that to the entropy of the black hole. So the entropy of the black hole starts out somewhere around here. Uh, that's the area of the initial black hole after gravitational collapse. Uh, and then um, we're gonna plot we're gonna plot the generalized entropy, which is area over four plus S outside. Uh, and by S outside, um, we mean the, quant the entropy of the, the fine grained entropy of the quantum fields outside the black hole. So if we plot this, well, the area goes down the entropy of the, um, well, let's see, I need to draw some more regions on my picture here. Um, so there's, this is where we calculate the area term. And then this region here is the outside part. Okay, so we're trying to calculate the entropy of the black hole that this radiation is entangled with. So that, that, that area goes down, there's not much, there, aren't, there isn't a lot of space in the outside region. So that contribution from the quantum fields doesn't make much difference. Uh, so this will just go down and eventually go to zero. And here we see the, the paradox much sooner because um, what we're plotting here is, is the the generalized entropy here, you should think of as the coarse grain entropy of the black hole. And it's impossible for the Hawking radiation, as soon as you get to this point in the diagram, you have a paradox because you have the Hawking radiation, which is entangled, which has this much entropy, it's entangled with the black hole, uh, but you, can't, you don't have enough stuff to be entangled with. You need the full system to be pure uh, and that means that you need enough degrees of freedom inside the black hole to, to produce that much entropy in the Hawking radiation. So there you have a problem. If the evolution is unitary, then what you expect to happen is something like this. So this is uh, the unitary S of R. In, a uni in unitary evaporation, uh, and this is similar to what you would get, for example, if you, if you burned a piece of coal. In unitary evolution, the, uh, Hawking, the entropy of the Hawking radiation goes up at early times because you're emitting more and more Hawking radiation. Uh, but eventually, there's just not enough stuff inside the black hole to make the entanglement go up anymore. At that point, which is called the page time, At that point, uh, the new Hawking radiation coming out of the black hole is entangled with the early Hawking radiation. So in a unitary system, the late radiation is entangled with the early radiation. That has to be the case because it has to, it has to be pure. It can't be entangled with some other stuff because there's just not enough stuff inside the black hole. So um, now we see the paradox here. This is the page, this is the refined version of the, of the paradox that we see in the page curve. Uh, there's an extra assumption going into this, which is the fact that the entropy of the black hole is given by the area. Whereas if we let the black hole evaporate completely, then we saw a paradox, uh, then, we, then we saw a paradox with fewer assumptions. Uh, but this other one gives us a better handle, gives us sort of a quantitative handle on exactly when the paradox is kicking in. 
and also suggests something that we should try to calculate uh, in order to understand this better. What we should try to calculate is the unitary curve. Okay, so uh, a big piece of the information paradox, uh, not the whole thing, but something that we would like to do is to understand how to calculate this. And that's what I'm gonna be describing. Before I get to that, um, I wanna make a few more general comments about um, the paradox. which has to do with when our calculations are reliable. Okay, so the Hawking calculation uh, of the density matrix rho, this is roughly this calculation we did at the beginning, although it's a little more complicated for an evaporating black hole. But the Hawking calculation of, of rho uh, is not exact. So we need to be careful about approximations here. This calculation was done using quantum field theory and curved space. So this is using the low energy effective theory. We didn't calculate it in string theory. Um, in other words, what Hawking's calculation really says is that the density matrix of the radiation is rho r thermal um, plus small corrections coming from, uh, say, loops. Well, that's one kind of correction that you can have to Hawking's calculation. But the other kind of correction you can have are non-perturbative corrections, things that come in like e to the minus s, where s is the area, the entropy of the, say, the initial black hole. So you can have small corrections to Hawking's calculation. So why should we worry about these? Well. When we calculate the von Neumann entropy, S of rho, uh, this is minus trace of rho log rho. If we write that as a sum over states, then uh, we can sum up the eigenvalues, lambda i log lambda i. Uh, for calculations involving a black hole, we might expect that there are e to the s terms in this sum, because they're e to the s terms uh, that, uh, that are contributing to the thermal ensemble. So if we have e to the s terms, then effects of size e to the minus s, uh, well, we don't know if those are big or small. The, these could potentially be large effects in the calculation of the entropy. So uh, in other words, um, we have to be very careful about whether this statement about the final radiation, the, so the statement was that the final radiation is mixed, but the point being that if there are very tiny correlations uh, amongst, the Hawking radi amongst the Hawking quanta, that could change this by a large amount. In order to diagnose whether the Hawking radiation is pure or mixed, you have to be able to calculate or, or measure these correlations amongst e to the s uh, well, you have to measure these e to the minus s size effects, or you have to measure correlations amongst many, many Hawking quanta, uh, and that's extremely hard to do. It's not something that we necessarily expect to be able to do in a low energy theory. Uh, now, so why do we call it? Why do we call it a paradox? If we should only call it a paradox if we have a, a calculation that's reliable. Uh, that, that gives a paradoxical answer. Um, so why are we calling it a paradox in this case? Well, the answer to that is basically that it seems to be very hard to modify this calculation in a way that preserves unitary. To put it precisely, uh, you can fiddle with these contributions of the density matrix by uh, small effects and potentially make it unitary. But in a unitary theory, the paradox 
must be resolved. by non-perturbative effects. Uh, so I won't really go into the argument for this, but basically what I'm saying is that uh, these small corrections like that would come from loops, not even just loops, but corrections that came from any modification of quantum field theory and curve space. You can, you can take ordinary QFT and curve space, do anything you want to it that's small, and you cannot cure this problem with the, with the um, von Neumann entropy of the radiation. So the corrections have to come. Uh, so if, if the theory is unitary, then the fix has to come from the non-perturbative terms. And so what makes this difficult is that um, we don't really have a good way of thinking about these terms. So they're sort of non-local in the sense that uh, they could come, for example, from different uh, saddle points or different topologies in the gravita gravitational path integral, which would look to be non-local from the point of view of the original geometry. So non-perturbative effects uh, means you cannot uh, solve this just um, by QFT in a fixed geometry. Um, so I have a question. Yes. Yeah, so uh, do you mean that uh, when we, we necessarily have to consider this non perturbative effects or we have to take these into our picture? So is the goal to uh, realize this final state of radiation as a pure state after you include this non-perturbative effect, not as a thermal or mixed state? Yeah, I would say the ultimate goal of the information paradox uh, is to be able to, well, if the answer is that it's unitary, which we strongly su suspect, then um, the ultimate goal is to be able to calculate rho r at late times and see that it's a pure state. That is not what we're going to do uh, in this lecture, but it turns out in these lectures, but it turns out that we can get pretty far even without being able to do that. And that's what I'm going to describe. Okay. So um, in the unitary theory, the paradox must come from these non-perturbative effects, um, but what are they? In other words, how do, uh, where would these e to the minus s terms come from? How do they actually um, fix the entropy? And secondly, how do we calculate them? And the point of uh, the rest of the lectures um, will be to argue um, that although we cannot calculate the density matrix, rho r, at late times, we can calculate its entropy. Uh, so the point of the rest of the lectures is to use the low energy theory to calculate the unitary page curve. Uh, going back up, the point is that we want to reproduce the red curve for the entropy of the radiation from the low energy effect field theory. Uh, that is from semi-classical gravity coupled to quantum fields, not, not counting microstates and string theory. So let's stop there for questions in the end of part one. And then we'll, so we'll do a few questions and then I, I guess take a five minute break. Thank you very much, Tom. So there's a question in the chat. So why is R of T region not included in the S out? So here, uh, when I say S out, I'm only talking about this region that is not part of R of T. That's by definition, because our goal here was to compare S of R to its complement. So um, 
you should think of the black hole as just being this part that's all the way up to the imaginary cut. The, the black hole is sort of everything inside the imaginary cutoff. And then R is the stuff outside the imaginary cutoff, just by that's our choice. Yes, and then there's also a raised hand. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. So I would like to ask, like, we started from a pure state, and then we have seen that after some time, we end up with a mixed state, and that's why we have uh, the non-vanishing entropy as uh, visualized in the screen. But yes. say we start from a mixed state, so we are already in a thermal background as initial state, so then the initial state is also a mixed state and the final state will be also a mixed state. So in this situation, will there be any information paradox? Um, it depends. So, so in that case, you have to work a little bit harder to see the paradox. It will depend basically on the, it will depend basically on how much entropy you have in the initial state compared to how big is the black hole that you produce. Um, if you want to see a sharp paradox, you need the black hole, you need the entropy of the, you need to be the entropy of the black hole to be bigger than the, the initial entropy. I think there's still a paradox in that case, um, in that I think you'll, I think you're still going to get the wrong answer if you do Hawking's calculation. So in that sense, there's a paradox, uh, but it's not, it, it's not easy to see the paradox because you have to now be comparing different entropies and it's not clear how big they're allowed to be. Okay, thank you. Okay, then I think this is a good time for, for a short break.